All right. So uh, I was asked to uh, address uh, where are the gaps in our understanding or knowledge of the functional landscape of uh, humans and mouse. And uh, uh, the, just the, the planners at this uh, uh, Work workshop actually gave me a list of, of questions that I was supposed to try to answer in this short time, and I'll try to touch on a fair number of these. Uh, first, the uh, current status uh, and what, what uh, new data production efforts should be the highest priority, what should we do in terms of validation and characterization, what future studies should be envisaged, if not limited by technology. I like that one. Um, uh, what technological breakthroughs would be transformative? How would you prioritize? And what do you need to make the data interoperable? And I promise to stop well, this, that my timer. I can see it right there because uh, the uh, others have lots to say. And happily, a lot of what I want to emphasize, you've heard parts of, but I, I do have, a, I want to give you my perspective on these. So first, the current state of mapping, this is not to scale, but, the Im, but the, I think the message is, is accurate. Uh, so you've got to think about this top layer is a, uh, uh, a two-dimensional matrix, cell types, and features. And it's been, this has been emphasized before, but let me say it again. There's some of these assays that really penetrate. Uh, and, and there's some uh, cell types where you only know uh, maybe two things about them, but you know two very valuable things about them. You get that DNA sensitivity, you get the RNA, you actually know a lot more about the tracheal epithelium than you did before. And then, then uh, this has been emphasized a few times, there are a few cell types for which there's a lot known. There's a lot of white in here. There's a lot that will have to stay white because the factors are not in those cells, right? You know, but still, there's an awful lot that hasn't been done. But that's uh, that's really just kind of a tip of the iceberg, and 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 context dependency has been emphasized over and over. So if you imagine that, it's that same matrix over and over again, uh, some number of times. Uh, it re responds to environmental stimuli, you know, uh, uh, time of, of differentiation or whatever, and for Every cell within each one of these matrices, there is actually a relevant time course. All right, so that's, and each one of these cells is whole genome data. This is huge amounts of data, and of course, no one really knows how many there are of any of these, but let's just put in some numbers that are not crazy, and, and I cited a few of these, and some of these I just guessed at, but if you just multiply all these together, it is multi multiplicative, just uh, uh, 2,000 cell types, 2,000 features, a bunch of conditions, a bunch of time points, is 800 million. You talk about brute force completion of the matrices, it's 800 million. That's why I think we're not gonna get there. I think we can get something extremely valuable, but I don't think we'll get to completion. Oh. So how do you get to something that's extremely valuable? Well, you can focus. And this is just looking at one particular system that I'm very, very interested in, and just looking at the myeloid component of, of hematopoiesis, a bunch of different cell types, uh, uh, that thanks to advances uh, it, to allow us to, to, get, to do RNA-seq and attack-seq in small numbers of cells, you can actually fill in the relevant matrix a lot. Everything that's colored is, is actually known, was known six months ago. The black is from ENCODE, the, the gray is from others. So, you know, focus will help you learn a lot. Of course, you, it, it won't cover every cell type, obviously. So that's current status. Uh, what else is needed? Well, my number one thing that I think is needed, and this uh, is consonant with other things you've heard, is uh, a 3D chromatin interaction maps. This is just one example of, of this, and showing that uh, alpha globin enhancers actually interact all through uh, a, a region that's a Clearly, that the regulatory region is mapped by K twenty seven acetylation. This is, now this guy Jim Hughes used a capture approach to get high resolution data. You can we saw some high C stuff, much lower resolution, and we have to embrace a whole range of scales and try to understand that range and try to hit many different cell types. And I think we've got to jump into the dynamics of these interaction maps because you're actually seeing regulation in process in progress. Uh, I wish I knew more about what, I thought 4D nucleome was going to give us lots of new data sets, right? And, and so when we, I hope we get some clarity on that, but at least there's some money going into this and it's very, very important. We need to interface with it. 
Um, and I do think that at least for several cell types, this could benefit from a top-down managed approach. Uh, there are other things we need. I, and so I actually do think we should move towards completion, even though I don't think we'll ever get to completion, but we will, we will get to a useful point that I'll mention uh, later. Um, so you need, need to, to map more factors and more cell types. And these really are serious limitations. The, the, I mean, maybe antibodies will get us from 200, well, let's say it was 300 factors uh, up, up to the 1,500 that are needed, but I, I, honestly, I doubt it. Um, Oh, man, and, and uh, a lot of these cells are pretty rare, and so you really have to get down to smaller numbers of cells. Uh, higher resolution would be very, very useful. I think you'll hear more about this from other uh, speakers later. Uh, and maybe, I mean, and you're hearing some calls for, for continuing with this top-down managed approach, of the, of, like we have in the current phases of, of have had an ENCODE so far, I think there's a lot of value from uh, opening it up to community-driven projects as well. And uh, throughout all of this, I mean, the, the dynamics. Dynamics is how you really, uh, I think you can really start to approach uh, a clearer understanding of what you want to, to know from this. And this is just a, a snapshot from a very well-studied system, uh, eryth erythroid maturation, beta-globin gene complex, and just looking across the time course, uh, not only at, at what's happening in the cells, but uh, the regulatory regions, which are uh, uh, have this factor got a one bound early on, and you can see later on the response, a million-fold increase in expression, a hundred-fold increase in, uh, in binding there. And, and, and I think this is the sort of data that we need um, uh, throughout, uh, and I'm going to have to say likely chosen parts of the, that many-dimensional matrix. Hence, I'm saying it should be driven by investigators who really understand these systems and can make the best case that this is where you're going to get the biggest bang for your bucks. Um, oh, then another question I was asking, what, what validation and characterization do we need of the functional elements? Well, we need to do this seriously and happily. You're hearing many speakers embracing this. And I kind of break it into there. There's some efforts that uh, would benefit from being highly managed and closely coordinated. In fact, it's ongoing now in, in phase three of ENCODE. Obviously, you want to use these high-throughput genetic screens that uh, have been developed recently. And we want to ensure that a certain fraction of the functional predictions are tested. And then you get an answer. How good were those predictions? You get this empirical p-value that, that, that Dana was, was asking about. Uh, now, I think everybody knows that, well, sure, you're going to start with the positive predictions, uh, uh, and, and you're going to uh, test those, but I also want to put in a pitch. <clears throat> Uh, do it broadly. Put in some negative predictions because you really also need to have some orthogonal ascertainment of what are you missing. You like this? All right. We're, we're, we're getting some enthusiasm here. Now, um, I, again, I, I don't see this happening throughout the entire matrix, but we have to have some well-chosen systems to investigate very, very uh, uh, deeply, uh, and, and actually this, this kind of information will extrapolate uh, uh, to, to broadly. Um, now I also, I, I do like the less tightly managed approaches and uh, look, you, you know, that there are all kinds of perturbations. I mean, you talk to anybody who's invested the, the, their career in a system or a locus or whatever, then that they're doing every kind of perturbation you can imagine and learning all kinds of things. So I think uh, uh, it's, it's not just uh, high-throughput enhancer assays, uh, large-scale genetic engineering for loss of functions and, and other things. And I, I think Will's going to talk some about that later. Uh, and, and this is pressing the envelope of what the NHGRI envelope it, uh, a portfolio is. But I think what we, we have to embrace these. Um, and, and, and Laurie's going to talk a lot more about this. But, you know, why look at lots of different perturbations? Well, because we, we are working with a fairly limited vocabulary of regulatory elements, and you can tell that there's much more heterogeneity from all kinds of things. This is just two different uh, assays for uh, fairly sophisticated predictions of, uh, of enhancers, and, and, and in both of these assays, some things work well, some things don't, um, and 
there's a large dynamic range about what's happening uh, on the, these different axes. That, that tells you heterogeneity. If you dig into these enhancers, you see diverse combinations of transcription factors. If you take an unsupervised learning approach to, to find a chromatin states, you don't come up with two, you don't come up with four. Uh, in, in this particular paper, we had 25 because we said that's the number that we'll work with, right? It, it, it's, it's bigger than even than, than that. So expanding the vocabulary, and, and I hope we hear from that uh, more. Um, and and you just, we, we need, uh, we know some popular assays right now. There's no reason to, to think that, that uh, functional assays are, that we've uh, come anywhere close to uh, exhausting the possibilities. And I would love to see, you know, periodic calls for proposals. Now, NHGRI can come in, you know, this is that, that catalyst, that facilitator, take the good assays and get them genome-wide. You get them genome-wide and then, you, you know, we can start to really co uh, uh, get large amounts of data together in a way that we'll, we'll start to learn systems better and also find out things we didn't expect. Uh, evolution has come, come up a few times, and so let me just emphasize, uh, you always get a lot of power from interpretations of comparisons. Uh, many of us kind of grew up in genomics uh, lining up uh, DNA sequences, and if you see motifs that are deeply conserved, it actually does mean something. It is, this is powerful. And you can interpret these alignments in evolutionary terms. You can do the same thing for epigenomics, and comparative epigenomics really does tell you a lot. You can take you know, just the same transcription factor and same locus in mouse and human, and then they actually do line up quite well. They actually line up better than the underlying sequences do. And one of the things that came out from the mouse encode uh, comparison was that there are these categories of functional evolution that's revealed by this comparative epigenomics. Uh, when I was younger, I really was in hopes that all functional regions would look like this, where you'd see, a, uh, if you see a factor bound in, say, uh, erythroblasts in mouse, that the orthologous sequence in human would have uh, a similar signal. And that does happen. It's a small minority of the time, and this marks some profoundly important uh, regulatory elements. This is uh, some work from uh, Mike Snyder's lab and, and, and our lab, showed that, that, that these guys, it's not, their function is not restricted to red cells, that they're, they're pleiotropic, they function in many other or, uh, uh, tissues. Lineage specificity, this is not uh, nature telling you it's not important, it's just tell, nature telling you it's lineage specific. Uh, and we also see a, a lot of evidence, there's a beautiful paper from uh, uh, John's lab about this, and, and uh, uh, we, we covered it in this paper, that <clears throat> you can, even if you don't see that feature in, uh, if you see that feature in mouse and you don't see it in that tissue uh, in uh, uh, humans, you can see the, uh, that piece of DNA being used in another tissue. There's a lot of turnover. It, 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 there, there's turnover in, in regulatory regions, but it, it, it's, uh, it's like the same pieces of DNA being used over and over again. And maybe as we do expand, fill in these matrices better and better, maybe the dimensions will reduce. Maybe this reuse thing could actually turn into something that, that, that would uh, 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 simplify what we're doing. But, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, uh, but evolutionary comparisons of both the genomes and the epigenomes is important. What future studies could be envisaged if not limited by technology? And this is, this is really fun to think about, and I just stuck, I'm going to stick with one because it is so beautiful. And if it's, if, if this is really happening, we, we've got to understand it better. I'm, I know this is happening, but, but we need to understand the mechanisms better. Directed movement of genes in the nucleus. You really do see, during activation, genes moving from inactive uh, uh, chromatin uh, territories to active ones. Some people will call those places with abundant RNA pol 2 transcription factories. Other people don't like that term, but there is this movement. You can also see co-localization of actively transcribed genes. This is some work from uh, Peter Fraser's group. In all these uh, uh, piece, pictures here, the alpha globin uh, complex is in red, and there's some other erythroid locus in green. And every time you see yellow, that's co-localization. And, and, and there are other studies that, that show the dynamics of that movement. 
And here's just a, another picture from, from uh, Peter's work, just to kind of give you this image that, uh, that, that it's not so much, it may not be so much gene activation by recruitment of all of these factors, but rather these factors bringing your locus to where it, it could really be uh, 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 highly transcriptionally, uh, uh, highly transcribed. So what, what directs that? Are there molecular locomotives? Is that, is that part of the vocabulary that we need to be uh, uh, thinking about? And, and is that what one type of enhancer does? Are there tracks that the gene follows to get uh, uh, from, from one place to another? We've got a lot of unexplained factor binding, maybe. Um, what determines how long you stay in that active zone? And, and uh, I, that's a really good model. That's an, that's an old one, for, but, but a, a good model for what some enhancers might be doing is, is just holding the um, polymerase there. Oh, and how much of, of this directive movement is actually generating so much of this non-coding RNA that we don't know what, how to explain? Something? To, to try to get at if technology isn't a limitation. So that was, uh, so I don't have to tell you, I don't have to come up with a way to do this, I just have to say it would be nice to know. Um, oh, and there are lots of other functional elements, and this is the, you know, there's some things you don't know, you, you don't know, and others, I know I don't know these. Uh, 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 replication machinery, well, happily, timing domains, that's coming out, and there's beautiful data, people have been showing it, but I don't think we know where the origins are. I don't think we know what sequences determine those. Uh, we haven't mentioned much about how uh, cells remember where, what they were as they go through uh, uh, mitosis. Now, you can certainly do factor binding through mitosis, and you see some things that are stable through mitosis, and um, some things where uh, the, uh, in this case, is uh, uh, accessibility changes during mitosis. Uh, what's going up on with those? Uh, what determines them? And do they, is this a special type of bound site? I think it probably is. And I think it's uh, 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 saying, hey, you know, we've got to turn these, uh, these sites on uh, real early. Uh, recombination hotspots, you know, that's, uh, I don't think we know. <laughs> I don't know nearly as much as I'd like to know about those or matrix attachment regions or others. I think there are lots of other features to try to get at. That was, uh, okay, now, oh, transformative technologies. This is a new question now that, that was asked. Well, uh, and here I'm just going to join in the, the chorus and say, yeah, uh, mapping um, binding profiles for very large numbers of transcription factors. Now, so if there's a better way to do it, I mean, if antibodies can do it all, that's fine. I just don't th think it's going to get us there. And there are lots of ways that you can think about uh, uh, more efficient, well, ways that are going to uh, extrapolate to many different loci. Going down to smaller numbers of cells, I mean, it's, I mean to be able to look at multi-lineage progenitors is fantastic. I do want to emphasize one point, because it's obvious as you go to smaller numbers of cells, you end up, you get down to one, right? This is, but here's what, I think many of you know this, but I have to emphasize it. You go down to single cells, you're not just got a new technology, you've got a revolution in your thinking. Because now you can really see that the heterogeneity, this is just a picture for, from um, work, work for, from uh, uh, Tarek Inver, and, and this is not genome wide or whatever, but you can, this is the picture, if you see, just colors here and there against the gray, that, that means it was expressed in just one of many cells, but these were all, when I do the experiments, these are all the same thing, right? I'm always looking at this as a population. Heterogeneity, stochastic events, and you know, this, these binary decision trees we show for differentiation, they could be all wrong. You know, I, I'm, on, as an ensemble, they're correct. <laughs> but in terms of following the path of any one cell, they, they may not be so useful. So we gotta, you know, I wanted to emphasize that. It's a, it's, it's, this is a revolution in the way you think about things. Um, now, uh, transformative technologies, oh, all right, so visualization. Okay, everybody said we need better visualization, but nobody's showing us that because, and, and just, let me just uh, um, picture this, right? So if, if instead of, you know, going through your browsers page after page and trying to remember what this locus looked like, another one just, this room has your genome, right? Every table is a chromosome, and, and, and you guys are all features, and I can zoom around and, 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 and really try and, and start to get a, 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 a more full understanding. And 
and actually be able to look whole genome and, uh, uh, and, and let the brain, your brain is really good at pattern finding, way, way better than some machine learning approaches. So, and, and uh, well-invested money that would bring in some uh, uh, new vis visualizations. I want to go into a virtual reality viewing environment and, 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 and just really dig into it. All right, uh, prioritize the needs. Uh, it's NIH, you got to go with disease relevance, but uh, man, if you can, it's new biological insights that drive things, uh, and I like projects that dig into newly fertile ground on the enduring questions. That's what I would prioritize. Oh, oh, okay, I got to say, I got 38 seconds here. Let me just, what else I going to say? Oh, oh, yeah, I got two things to say here. First of all, all right, what's needed to uh, make the new data interoperable? It's all data coordination. We have to have all of these aspects, and we've heard them before, rapid data release, expert curation, uniform data processing, easy access to everybody. This is, this is the heart of anything. Whatever you call the next phase, this is it. You gotta have a, 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 a really strong DCC. Oh, and, but you don't have to do everything in a top-down managed way. You can do it with a community-driven project, but it all does feed into the DCC. And this is the last point I wanted to make was, uh, so this is kind of the current structure for, for ENCODE. You have some data production centers, a small number of them, and you've got the economy of scale and all this, and they really pump out the data, and the DCC keeps it. This blue background means that there's a lot of crosstalk within here, a lot of coordination and quarterly reports. This is it. You could have a consortium that's less coordinated. The systems will be chosen by investigators proposing and reviewers evaluating. And there's gonna be a much larger number of production centers. They still have to adhere to the standards. They can help develop them, evolve. It still goes through the DCC and you have to have good interfaces for the users. This lighter background means less managed annual reports, perhaps. Okay, how do you know when you're, you're, you're complete? We, we can do predictive modeling, and, and I'm out of town, time, so I, <laughs> I might be out of town after I say this. Uh, 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 but this, this is, you need, you need a metric for when you're complete. And whether you, you, you wanna go with accuracy of predictive modeling or whatever else, is got, there needs to be a measure. I just don't think we're gonna, the brute force approach is gonna work. Oh yeah, and this is the last point. Uh, once you know enough that you can identify the gaps, sometimes you can find that gap is actually filled by something very valuable. This is the front range of the, the, the Poconos and, and the Delaware River cut through there a long, long time ago. It's absolutely gorgeous. So, uh, you know, gaps can be good. Okay, so that, that, that's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna stop now. Now, Carol, did, did you want me to take some questions now or wait? Okay. Okay, good, all right. So I actually like your, your two structures, um, and I'm thinking more on, on the more less uh, controlled structure. But um, can you think of some in, 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 in intermediate? So how would you make sure that the data can be, for example, managed by the DCC, and at least that the data quality produced, even if the systems aren't coordinated, yeah. um, at the end, at least the, the, the assays are comparable? Right, so, so let, let's say there was a call for proposals and, and it really, fit, you know, along the structure I put over there on the right. Well, you you'd still would have to, uh, all the investigators would have, have to buy into uh, that there are going to be data standards and that will be, ex now the data standard, number one is there will be quality metrics put on all of these data. And, and, and exactly what the threshold is for, for getting, bringing it in, you know, that might, well, that could probably evolve. But let me also say, you know, there have been some studies that the community-generated data may have been predominantly crap early, but they're not anymore. It is, there's a lot of really good stuff out there, and we need, we need the numbers. And the numbers can be, you know, you, the, the metrics are established. Yeah. Okay, cool. A uh, quick, simple question. How many of the ENCO cell lines have a good quality whole genome sequenced? How many ENCODE cell lines have a high quality genome sequence? Thank you. I, was, I knew somebody knew the answer. 
about four or five of them. Um, they're messy. I mean, the cancer line. These are MCF7, uh, oh. K5, Did you have a follow-up tool? You, I mean, you must have had something no, in mind. I, I was going to say, <laughs> uh, now that we have X10 and relatively cheap sequencing, would it be worthwhile to get the genomes of at least the, the cells that okay. have most assays? Okay, yes. And so that would be another type of data. We, to, we to agreed to that five okay. years ago. We just haven't finished it. Yeah, this, this is Mark. I, I just want to second that. I mean, people probably know I've always repeated that thing. I think it just given the investment we have in the functional assays, it would be so valuable to have the proper whole genome sequences for some of those core cell lines. So, so there's some history. Uh, uh, the history doesn't matter. We started doing it with the big centers and had to stop. But I think ENCODE c should do this this year. It, it could be done very quickly. I volunteer. Oh. Great. So if you have questions for Ross, hold them. We'll do them in the end. And so Lori is um, going to talk next.